So I'm I'm Mark Payton. I'm um, a PhD scientist actually, and uh, a geneticist and a biochemist. So very early clinical studies are usually done in a safe clinical setting, where if something goes wrong, there's somebody there who can look after you. As you get into later studies, it tends to be more and more. You're given something and you go home, and you're given a diary. Nowadays, a lot of studies have electronic diaries, and you fill the diaries in electronically. If you don't do them, it reminds you. <laughs> so, so it kind of prompts you to do um, things. Uh, because it's actually, it's actually borderline whether you can actually hospitalise, you know, 500 patients for three months each. So it's only those very early studies where you're worried about what the safety risk is for a, for a clinical trial that you really do that in, in a clinical trial centre. Clinical trials are roughly split into phase one, two, three, and four. Phase one is a handful of people. It's usually people who don't have the disease. It's volunteers, um, very often students. You kind of need the money. In phase two, you've, you've, you're starting to get into patient populations uh, that have the disease, and then you can start to find a dose that really works in those patients. And then you do a phase three study, which is usually quite large, it has to be pre-agreed with the regulators. And then if you really look, you'll get approval. And then sometimes, and increasingly, you'll be asked to do a phase four study, which is post-approval and post-marketing, to follow 10,000 patients to make sure there's no safety signal that we missed. Okay, so it's, it's expensive and long. And the very first step, like we are here in the play, is, is the easy bit. Because actually that usually doesn't go wrong. You know, usually you won't see an efficacy signal, but you usually won't see a safety signal either. Yes, uh, it takes two or three years before you can get near the clinic for the very first time. And then once you get near the clinic, you're looking at about another eight years probably to approval. And you know, if you could draw a graph of the costs involved, um, you'd need logarithmic paper with a logarithmic scale, because the costs at the beginning are quite low, but then they go up like that. So, so, and it, a single study can cost a hundred million dollars, no, no problem. So, so when you look at the way pharmaceutical companies operate, they, they, they have a, a, a principle which is called fail fast. And so if you have a portfolio of drugs, and most big companies have 50, 100 drugs in development at various stages of clinical development, you've got, you still have a limited budget. How do you decide which drugs to take to phase three? You know, so, there's one very obvious cut. If they don't work, don't do it. <laughs> you know, so, but how do you take something that works, gives you a 20% improvement in a disease where there's already another medication, versus one that gives you an 80% improvement where there's only 1,000 patients in Britain? What do you do? That is ex exact mirror image of what NICE is about which is about clinical benefit and a cost benefit to patients. And, you know, we're not interested in the next thing, which is 1% better. We're interested in really life-changing medications. Actually, there's a whole, I don't know, alternative pharmaceutical industry um, devoted to what is now called repurposing. It's a pretty awful word. So it's the repurposing of drugs that were developed for one indication in another indication. And those indications can be miles apart. You know, it could have been developed for neurology and now you're using it for asthma. You know, it could have been developed for, uh, as an anti-tumor agent and now you're using it 
obstructive pulmonary disease. Yeah. And, and so things like that happen, and a whole industry has built up on the back of doing that. Because it's moral, but it's also profitable. Yeah. The drugs are out there and you know they're safe. Why go back to the start and spend all this money and all that time and put patients at risk when if that works, why bother? Now, some of the drugs that were recently developed for depression they actually used in smoking cessation, for example. That's one example. Some of the drugs that were developed as anti, you know, anti-inflammatories are actually being used in oncology now. You know, And part of that is that you know, we just understand more you know, so some of the mechanisms that we thought were unique to a particular disease actually are pretty relevant to other diseases as well. Um, but it's also the fact that if you've paid a billion dollars to get a drug approved, you, you want to try it in all the diseases where it might possibly work. Everybody cites the, the Viagra example. And um, uh, you'll hear several different stories, and who who knows what one's true? But you know the one that you know the one that I like the best around this is that a lot of people you're supposed to return your medication after a clinical trial, and um, in, you know in this particular case of Viagra, they, they didn't, and they didn't hand it back, and the nurses figured it out before the doctors did. Because you know, no one, no one wanted to actually fess up to what the un, unexpected um, benefit was from from Viagra, because it was developed for angina originally. Drug development will be driven by changing demographics. So, if if you could, you know, if you could go back to the early 1900s and diagnose Alzheimer's disease properly. I bet you'd hardly find it. And it, I, it's probably not because it was misdiagnosed. It's because apart from rare genetic variants, it's a disease of the aged, the elderly. Most people didn't make it to 50 and 60. So you never saw it. And actually, most people's life expectancy is 80. So if you look at a neurodegenerative disease like that, that is just huge. It's a time bomb. You know, and all of the other diseases of aging, you know, osteoarthritis, you know, all of these, you know, diabetes, you know, all these kind of, those kind of things. What what how do you what what are the diseases of the elderly and how do you prioritize healthcare costs? It's it's the same issue that pharma companies face. In, in developing drugs. It's, it's in part about, yes, how can I recoup my costs because you know, we are a business and we've got shareholders and we have to do it. But you'll always find room for development of um, medicines where it's maybe not that obvious that there's a huge market. It's really important to continue to do medical trials. There are, there are not only a host of diseases which are completely untreated and untreatable, but I, I'm a big believer in early intervention in, in, in medicine. And, and the earlier you get in, the more you can limit the downsides. And so Treating diseases early is key, and it, it's not a thing we've traditionally done. You know, it's not a national health service actually; it's a national illness service. You know, it's, it's almost too late when you're when when you're treating people. And so, you know, I think that uh, a focus on rare diseases, I think, is required where there are no known treatments, and you know, treatments that um, are more focused to the patients. And actually, we've just never thought that way before. So, I think there's a a massive need to try and identify drugs that work incredibly well for a subset of patients, you know, rather than a broad 
based approach and 20% of people will do okay and 20% of people will have a side effect. So I think we've got to completely change the way that we start to do clinical studies. So there's a lot more drugs needed that actually treat the people who are very ill-served right now by some of the, the kind of very, very broad-based medicines. And, you know, I, I think we know how to do that, but it's expensive and we all have to prioritise. But I, I don't think, you know, particularly with, you know, people living longer, We've, we've got to treat these things because otherwise it's going to be an absolutely unbearable healthcare cost.